right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to welcome Stephen Howard, who is in actually Mexico City, just uh, over the border and a ways a bit. How are you doing, Stephen? Oh, outstanding, John. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And, and Stephen brings expertise in leadership, business development, and marketing. He is the creator of the human uh, leadership approach to people-centric leadership, uh, named uh, to the list of the top 200 biggest global voices on leadership in January 2023 this year by Leaders Home Network. Congratulations on that. Thank you, sir. And an award-winning author of just it's a couple of books. Uh, let's see, it's twenty-two books with forty year, forty-five years of international senior sales and marketing. I mean, I'm getting exhausted reading about all your achievements here, Stephen. <laughs> I think that's enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And today, what we're going to talk about is how stress and anxiety impact your decision making. So, um, Stephen, we were just talking a little bit about this before before coming on air, but certainly. In the time, I was telling you, I came from Ireland during the dot-com, you know, 25 years or so ago. And uh, my journey through corporate America, I came to realize, you know, how how stress, anxiety and all those things, they're almost celebrated. They're bad, almost worn like badges of honor. And and like if you don't look stressed or you don't look like overwhelmed, um, well, then what are you doing? <laughs> you don't, people go, well, they can't be busy or they're not that important or they don't have that much going on. So what's your, uh, why do you think that is? I, I, I think it's just the way the business world developed in the 80s and 90s and the early parts of this century. I, I do think it's changing now. I know the younger generation, particularly the Generation Zs, uh, Generation Z, Zers, I guess they're called, yep. are looking much more for uh, work-life harmony, and and uh, work is not the, you know the number one thing in their lives now. But but you know it's funny though because it became a badge of honor, and I remember everyone the the pat answers, how you doing, John? I'm busy. How you doing? I'm busy. And it's a, I often ask people, busy doing what? I'm yeah. oh, just being busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And what I love nowadays, uh, to be honest, uh, Stephen, is if you ask people, if you ask that question, are you busy? They say, oh, I'm busier than I've ever been, ever been in my life. And you're going, oh, yeah. So what are you doing? And they're just, and as you said, they'll be just, oh, I'm busy. And I, my comeback is always, are you busier, though? Or are you more distracted than you've ever been in your life? Because I think that's more to the point. Because, I mean, once upon a time, we didn't have all these distractions at hand, right? You know, I mean, I can pick up my phone now and check sports results. I can have this going on. I can have a whole other. So I think part of it is the is the distraction and looking busy. It is. And I have to share with the audience because I did spend 21 years or sorry, 12 years living in Australia. And there's a great phrase in Australia. You say, how you doing? This is the phrase is, I'm flat out like a lizard drinking. And if you can just visualize that. It, uh, but, you know, you talk about distractions. Um, research shows that the average person now checks their mobile device 100 times a day. So let's say you get eight hours sleep. That gives you 16 hours left. That means you're checking your phone six times an hour or mm -hmm. roughly every 10 minutes which is it's just phenomenal it's crazy yeah no that's that's an amazing statistic and i think for some of the some of the kids coming through is every once every 60 seconds but yeah um, um so um so how do we start to number one identify how do you identify stress and anxiety and how, how would you identify when they're really starting to become a problem because stress and anxiety is a, is a gateway to you know depression and breakdown all of all, a lot of really serious stuff and and, and long term serious stuff yes. too because prolonged stress will uh, have a negative impact on our long term brain health and increase our risk for dementia when we're in our sixties and seventies. Um, John, we all we all react to stress differently, and we all have s uh, signs of it. I know, for instance, in my case, my palms will get sweaty will be one of the first signs. Other people, they'll get tension in their shoulders. Um, others will get headaches. Um, so we, we what we have to do is self monitor it and understand that, and then know what we can do to get out of stress, to get out of anxiety, so we're not making decisions, particularly when we're in that mode. And, I, and that's an interesting what you just said there, because I think that's the issue. I mean, like you said, I mean, we can all probably identify if we take a moment 
the signs of when we're getting stressed or anxious. The problem is in those moments is we don't have the tools or know what to do to actually rectify the situation. That we don't, and I, it's what I recommend um, people to become first responders, not first reactors. Um, and it's something I picked up when I learned how to scuba dive. I, I learned to be all the way up to a rescue diver. And the first thing they teach us in rescue diving is um, don't just jump in the water when somebody yells, help, help, help. Uh, you have to stop and assess the situation. Are there fishing nets in the water? Are there sting, uh, stingrays or jellyfish? Or, you know, everyone thinks sharks, but that's kind of unusual. And we have to understand what the risks are that we're putting ourselves into. So same thing with our EMTs. That's why they're called first responders. They, you know, they don't rush to a car accident and jump out of the vehicle and rush over to the car. You know, they look to see if there's smoke or there's sparks, there's a gasoline on the ground. Uh, and so the same thing here in our both professional and um, personal lives, we need to pause. We need to stop and get a, get a hold of ourselves, and then we can respond, not react to people, events, and situations. Yeah, and 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 I I, I agree com- I agree completely with you there. And uh, but it's really hard, isn't it, that that to take that moment because we live in a world now that's so reactionary, that's so instant. Like you have to, and and that we've fallen into that trap of not being able, of not being, or not allowing ourselves those moments to consider everything before before acting. And, and you know, John, it's interesting that the brain physiologically, <clears throat> which it's under stress, it is actually wired to do what we call binary decision making. So when the brain is stressed, it shuts out options. It, it looks at everything in black and white, one or two, this or that, uh, A or B. So binary choices. When many times what we need in particularly big decisions is other options. And so... <clears throat> We don't have to pause. It's not like taking a five minute pause. Sure. Quite frankly, it takes eight seconds for once we make a conscious decision to get ourselves under emotional control, it takes about eight seconds for the prefrontal cortex, the front part of our brain to take back over to be back in charge from our amygdala, which is at the back of our brain, which is the emotional control center. So it's only eight to 10 seconds is all we need, but we have to learn to do it. Yeah. And the, and the, yeah, and, the, and it's amazing, like you say, you know, eight to ten seconds, and most people go, "Well, that, that's easy. I I could do that." But the reality is that uh, eight to ten seconds can be quite a long time for somebody who's anxious and stressed and feels like they need to act immediately. Yeah, yeah. And so, what I when I coach leaders, particularly in the business world, what I suggest they do is it's because rather than feel like they're embarrassed or pause, is ask a question. Rather than make a decision, ask a question. Get Sometimes the easy question is, tell me more about this. And give yourself those eight to 10 seconds. You're still listening to the person, but you're giving your brain a chance to get back into rational mode and out of emotional mode. But it, you know, it takes effort. Yeah, and I think, and I, I love what you just said there. Yeah, because I, I think sometimes... Um, you know, we feel the need to react immediately. But as you said, by clarifying, asking something clarifying, it's a great way of forcing that gap, to forcing that pause on us. And also acting with more information, because like you said, if our brains go into binary mode and like only have this or that, uh, by asking that question, hopefully that's helping us to start to see that there are more options. There are more options. There are more options. And the other thing is, it takes a bit of courage. And but I, I teach leaders now to also say, when somebody says, "Well, here's the situation. What do you think?" The first response should be, "I think I need time to think about that. Uh-huh. Give me ten minutes. Give me twenty minutes. Give me half." Now, obviously, if it's a, a dire emergency, a safety sure. issue, you have to react. But in general, most decisions can can be put off for 20 minutes or 30 mm-hmm. minutes. And and so my reaction to, is to say to people, I, you know what, I think I need to think about that. Let me ask you a couple of questions and then give me 20 minutes and I'll get back to you or give me half mm-hmm. an hour and I'll get back to you. And it's probably interesting as well, Stephen, is to understand like um, – when we see something, I mean, perspective, like we often like get really anxious or really elevate something that if we took a step back and put it in perspective, isn't, as you said, I mean, if it's life threatening, sure, but let's face it, majority of our jobs and our day to day lives is not, we're not dealing with life threatening situations, but sometimes we tend to elevate other things to that level. 
and we do and and what's sad is is this where we make less than optimal decisions and then we have to go back a couple hours later and refix it because <laughs> our our first decision is not is not necessarily the best decision and uh, so we have to course correct again so we're we're just hurting ourselves with less than optimal decision making <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and then, uh, you know, as as a leader, right, because let's face it, people take their cues from their leaders. Uh, and so if a leader, if how can a leader show the, the optimal way of handling high stress situations? And to do the things I was just talking about, pause. Mm. Um, tell people, you know, we're not going to make a decision right now. Let's think about this for the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it happens to be. Um, to understand, you know, people will role model that. If, if I, as a leader of a department, mm -hmm. don't make snap decisions, then my people are going to learn. Oh, they don't have to make snap decisions either. They don't have to make snap recommendations. They should be able to tell me, hey, you know what, boss? I need, let me think about this for 10 minutes or 15, let me get back to you. Uh, we, we we don't always have to have the answer at the tip of our finger. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's another part. And I think that that's a part too, that uh, sometimes people feel, and leaders often feel like they're supposed to have all the answers and it's impossible. I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous idea to begin with. But in today's in today's world and the complexity of work today is that you can't possibly be an expert on everything. So there's a lot of stuff you're not going to know that you're going to need to go away and check. But some people still feel like they have to provide some sort of answer, even to something they don't know anything about. They do. And it's unfortunate. But it, again, the leadership has changed. Coming out of the pandemic, so many things about leadership have changed. And, you know, one of the things is, is to be a humble leader uh, and to show a little bit of humility and say, look, I don't have all the answers. Let's mm -hmm. let's work on this together. Here's what we know right now. Let's go figure this out. Uh, and that's going to be a, a better optimal decision. And at the same time, you're going to elicit buy in from your team members or your colleagues or your peers, because when people discuss decisions together, they tend to buy into the final decision, even though it may not be, may, may not be theirs. Now, maybe somebody else has a, another idea we go with, but because at least we've had input into the decision-making process, as human beings, we tend to buy into the final decision. And I think you're correct. I think COVID, uh, uh, if there's any silver linings out of something like that, uh, it is it is areas like this where I think the human element has come back into play. I mean, obviously, you've done a lot of work on that, the, the human element in, in in leadership. But I feel there's there's a craving for that from everybody. And I think it's almost, it, maybe it's given some leaders permission to be a little bit, if you like, uh, to be a little bit more humble, to be a little bit more real, because we've done all, it's the first probably global collective experience we've ever had, right? I mean, because like world wars were, you know, didn't touch South America, for instance. Right. I mean, this was something that it was a global shared experience. So I think it gave people a permission because they have that shared experience to maybe be a little bit more open. To be a bit more open, to be a bit more humble, to um, just connect with people. I mean, we, one of the silver linings is that we understand that people do want human connections and leaders now have to excel at that human connections. And part of that, well, the human connection starts with trust. So that's one of the best ways to build trust. Yeah, and and that's an interesting that you mentioned trust because there's no big, there's no greater stressor in many ways than when you don't trust each other, right? There, there's always that underlying anxiety, underlying tension, and if you don't trust, so so building that trust is 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 so important. And today's leaders, it's you're building trust often with people that you don't see face to face. Maybe you just see them virtually, you know, because everything yeah. is so spread out and, and and decentralized now. Yeah, I mean, you've even hired them and onboarded them virtually yeah. as well. <clears throat> yeah. One of the things, you know, one of the things I think leadership has changed john is you know i know a lot of leaders i've seen a lot of been in a lot of meetings when a new leader comes in and he says all right here's how you earn my trust and that doesn't work anymore so when i i coach mentor leaders today as i say you need to go into your team and say i trust you here's how you can lose my trust you can lie to me you can hide something you can not come to me soon enough when you know you can't handle a situation or it's beyond your capability uh, blaming others that's how you can lose my trust and that's a different mindset and that's really what the main area that leadership has changed coming out of the pandemic is we need to change our mindsets about what it means to be a leader and particularly a leader of people 
Yeah, no, I love that idea about saying, like, you know, I trust you, but here's how you can lose my trust. It really flips it on its head. What I used to do in a couple of companies that I used to run um, a number of years back is I used to always just say to say to everybody, I say, if you ask me a direct question, I will give you a direct answer. If I have the information, if it's not something that I am precluded, like by, you know, uh, the parent company from from telling you, or I don't know. So... You will. You can ask me anything, and that's it. I'll either give you a straight answer, I'll tell you I don't know, or I'll say I'm sorry, I can't share that information. Yeah, absolutely. Or I don't know, but I'll get back to you by mm-hmm. Monday with the and you know I'll look into this. I will get back to you, and then obviously follow up that commitment to get back to people. <laughs> yeah. Well, because I think people, I think people underestimate sometimes uh, the power of saying I don't know. Um, because how trust building that is, because people wouldn't probably instinctively think that's the opposite, but it's not. Because think of that, if you're an expert in something, and I think you're an expert in something, and I ask you something and you go, huh, I'm not sure, I don't know, actually, let me look that up. I now have more trust in you because now I know that if you don't know something, you're not going to BS me, right? Exactly, exactly. And that that is what relationships are based on, um, is that trust factor. Yeah. Um, and, and what what are some other changes that you are seeing uh, that's happening now in, in leadership uh, that can start that start to make it more, shall we say, a little bit more level in how it's executed? Uh, I think the number one thing, John, is um, the concept that managing people is really a 1980s construct and it's not relevant. It's not applicable today. You, you manage people policies, you manage processes, you manage procedures, you manage things, you manage projects, but you lead people. Yeah. And that's a, that's the mindset change right there. And, that, and that's the core of the human leadership book and the whole concept of what the word human means from a leadership standpoint is to be people centric, is to understand that, you know, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I can't wait to be managed by my boss. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and certainly no one says, I can't wait to be micromanaged today. So, <laughs> so it's a mindset that change about how people leaders and to me a leader is anybody who leads people anybody has somebody reporting to them as a leader is a leader by definition so it's, i'm not just talking about people in the c-suite i'm talking about supervisors team mm-hmm. leaders uh, first line leaders second line leaders uh, sales leaders uh, they're all leading people and mm-hmm. so the mindset change is probably the number one thing that i see is changing and needs to change coming out of the pandemic. Yeah. And that and that everybody's a leader, as you said. I mean, even you know, the concept of leading yourself, you don't have to have a team or whatever. You can lead yourself and you can lead by example. You can model behavior. I mean, I wish more people understood that rather than uh, shouting at people and telling them they're stupid if you don't believe in what I believe is like or do what I do. And you think, no, model the behavior and then maybe you'll have an impact. And that's the other thing that's changing, John. I think people are not going to tolerate bullying bosses like mm-hmm. that anymore. Um, and hopefully organizations will start to move those people aside. I, I know I coached a, a leader a couple of years ago in in uh, Texas in the oil and gas industry. You know, the oil and gas industry mm-hmm. is very masculine, very tough mm-hmm. and robust. And uh, the leader was that kind of person. He would shout and scream at his people. He'd slam slam his fist on the table. He'd throw papers around the room when he was upset. And, uh, you know, I was talking about this and he says, well, that's just the way I am. People have to accept that. And uh, I sat down with him one day and I said, do you do that in church? I know, I know you're a religious person. I know you're a church going person, your family. Do you, do you do that in church? Oh, of course not. I said, well, do you do that? Uh, your son's soccer game, your daughter's volleyball game. Oh no, of course not. That's, that's would be inappropriate. Mm-hmm. I said, well, why, why do you do it in the office? It's not you. This is your office persona. This is something you, you want to project, but this is not you. This is not who you are. It's only who you are in the office. And he took that to heart. I give him full credit. Uh, he he started to change his ways. It took some time, but he understood that he would be a better leader rather than a better boss, but a better leader by changing the way he interacted with people. Yeah, that's a that's a great story because I think that um uh, because of the fact that you drew the contrast between how he acted elsewhere, and I do think that is the thing that hopefully is starting to go away is this idea that you 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 put on a you 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 play a role and you put on a mask when you go to work. It's not really who you are. I mean, why if you want to be if people want authenticity, if they want to trust people and all that, then the only way you're going to achieve that is by actually being yourself. 
Absolutely. And then, and then likewise, you, you will accept the un- authenticity of the people working for you. And, you know, and they're all different. So one of the key things about leaders today is you can't lead everyone the same way. You're different than me. You're different than your wife. You're different than, you know, the neighbor next door. And you have to lead each one of you differently. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, listen, this has been fantastic. Uh, and, and all of Stephen's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Stephen, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do today. Well, thanks, John. I, I, other than writing, which I'm still writing a few books, I, uh, I coach and mentor leaders. Uh, and I, I do a lot of corporate and association keynote speaking on, on various leadership topics. So uh, everything like we just talked about, talk about managing people and changing your your mindset about leadership. So I do a lot of uh, those kind of corporate um, association keynote speeches. Yeah. And by the way, for some, for anybody who's uh, never written a book or been involved in writing a book, um, what uh, the, the amount of books you've written and you're continuing to write, that, that's an amazing achievement. Well, thank you. Thank you. I kind of have a process down. I, you know, I only write nonfiction books, uh, mm-hmm. for books that will help people either professionally or personally develop. And uh, But yeah, there is a method to my madness. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, listen, thanks again, Stephen. Thank you for watching, listening, and I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you, John. Pleasure talking with you.